moment. Good morning. Shabbat Shalom. And welcome to Brit Hadashah, Messianic Jewish Synagogue. We thank you for joining us, whether you're here live and in person or watching the service and streaming with us. Uh, we pray the Spirit of the Lord would be rich in our midst this morning. Remind you that uh, we don't pass a plate. The tithes and offerings can be uh, put in the sadaka boxes if you're here with us. Otherwise, you can uh, give online through, through Realm or through uh, the United States Postal Service. We're uh, delighted to have Rich Cleary with us this morning. He'll be sharing the mass message a little later. Rich is our connection through Tacoon and Kingdom Living Congregation in Kansas City. And just one point of order for the people who are here in the sanctuary. We're having trouble with the uh, projection screen behind me. So you, you all need going to have to turn a little bit to your right to look at the other screen this morning. But that's not too much to ask of you. Let's pray. Yeshua will love you. We praise you. It, it, we are honored and privileged to be able to gather together for corporate worship today. Lord, may you use this time to build up this congregation, to speak to us through music, through liturgy, through the ministry of the word. Lord, our desire is to be a vibrant community, to produce disciples to impact Memphis and Tennessee and the world for the kingdom of Yeshua Messiah. Lord, may we be those empty vessels that you fill through the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord God, that that Shabbat was made for man and not man for Shabbat. So let us enter into his presence with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Thank you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Please rise and join me in the Barku. Barku et Almai Hamevo. Baruch Adonai Hamvorach Le'olam Vayen Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One for all eternity.
you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day be upon your heart. And you shall teach them diligently to your children and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, and when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand and let them be frontlets between your eyes. And you shall write them on doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Messiah Yeshua added, Be'ahavta nebraka kamoka. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Higher Torah and the prophets hang on these two commands.
Though the sun
my Israel, Shema Israel. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai, Adonai Echad. Shem Kevo Maputo, Leolam, Leolam. Shalom. As we continue our worship, can you join me in reading uh, God's word? We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, the seen and the unseen, whether thrones or angelic powers or rulers or authorities, all was created through him and for him. He exists before everything and in him all holds together. He is the head of the body, his community. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in all things. For God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, making peace through the blood of his cross, whether things on earth or things in heaven. Amen. And then if you'll turn with me or follow along with me um, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. It is not based on deeds, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua for good deeds, which God prepared beforehand, so we might walk in them. Amen.
already doing so and you're able to, will you please rise?
Baruch Adonai Hamorach. Baruch Adonai Hamorach Leolam Bayet. Baruch Adonai Hamorach Leolam Bayet. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam. Asher Baharbanu Mikol Hamim. Veinatan Lanu Et Torato. Baruch Atah Adonai Notein HaTorah. This week's Hebrew reading is Devarim 12:29-31. Ki yachalit Adonai lehecha et haguyim asher ata vashema lerashet otam mipanecha vayarshata otam vayashavta vaartsa. Hashemer lecha pen inakesh aharchichen achre hasham dam. Mipanecha ufen id rosh, the Elohehem lemor, echa avdu hagoyim haele, et Elohehem the ese ken gam ani. Lo tausu ken the Adonai Elohecha ki ho taovata Adonai asher shene. Asu le Elohehem ki gam et benehem ve et benatehem yisrafu ve es le Elohehem. Amen. Today's Torah reading comes from Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 29 through chapter 13, verse 1. When Adonai, your God, cuts off before you the nations that you are going in to dispossess, when you have dispossessed them and settled in their land, be careful not to be trapped into imitating them after they have been destroyed before you. Do not inquire about their gods, saying, How do these nations serve their gods? I will do the same. You are not to act like this toward Adonai, your God. For every abomination of Adonai, which he hates, they have done to their gods. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, you must take care to do. You are not to add to it or take away from it. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam. Asher natan lanu Torah demet, vechai olam nata betochenu. Baruch atah Adonai, noten ha Torah. Amen. All right. This week's portion came from right here. This is a
Today's Haftorah reading comes from Isaiah 55, verses 1 through 3. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the water, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen, so that your soul may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, the trustworthy loyalty to David. Right. And today's Besorah reading comes from John chapter 6, verses 35 through 38. Yeshua said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But I told you that you have seen me, yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and anyone coming to me I will never reject. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. The uh, Torah portion today is called Re'e, uh, which means sea, to see. You know, it's not the ocean sea, and it's not the letter C. It's, it's to see, a, a, a visual thing. And for this drosh, I've decided to name it Vitamin C, S-E-E. -E. <laughs> this portion begins with Adonai telling the Israelites to see, and again, the vitamin C, the blessings and the curses placed before them. He gives them clear instruction to listen to what is required to receive the blessings and how, to, how their noncompliance will bring about curses. In a similar way, vitamins I take helps my body produce key compounds for proper function and protection from illness. If I have sufficient quantities, then I'll be healthier. But if I'm deficient, I can become ill. I, we need vitamin C to maintain physical health, but we need the spiritual vitamin C to maintain a strong faith and spiritual health. The remainder of the Torah portion lists many of the commandments that were required in the community, with the result being an increase of their vitamin C. These laws included worship requirements, sacrificial rules, and eating guidelines. It includes instruction for dealing with prophets and false prophets, things that are clean and unclean, the forgiveness of debt, the treatment of the poor, and details about the feast. And if they obeyed all of these, then they certainly contributed to their supply of vitamin C. The Haftor portion, Isaiah 55, 3, explicitly says, incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. The Brit Hadashah portion, Yochanan 6.36 tells us that you have seen me, but do not believe. So obviously, those people didn't have enough vitamin C. These two verses convinced me early on that I, I can't just see what I want to, to see or listen to whatever I want to listen to. There's only one way to the Father, and it's through the Son, he directs me what to see and hear with the help of the Ruach. To me, 3,500 years later, in the comfort of my home, it seems pretty simple and straightforward. The Israelites were privy to enormous quantities of vitamin C during the Exodus. The Israelites, um, I mean, who wouldn't be permanently swayed about Adonai's blessings after seeing the divided Red Sea or listening to the roaring voice on the mountain or seeing water from the split rock. Unfortunately, human nature hasn't changed, and like the Israelites, I also become complacent, distracted, negligent, and selfish, even when large quantities of vitamin C are all around me and free for the taking. In 2001, I had LASIK surgery to help my nearsightedness. My vision was horrible. It was 2,600, meaning that what normal people could see at 600 feet, I could only see at 20 feet. My glasses were thick and heavy. 
My eyes were scarred after years of glass contacts. For the first 40 years of my life, I missed a lot of details and instructions and had to endure continuous discomfort because of my condition. What was the way out of this? It was one particular event, the LASIK surgery, that set me free permanently from this malady. But there were things that had to change. I had to turn away from the habits that had developed over 40 years, especially like knowing where my glasses were at all times. And believe it or not, I joined a boxing team and that didn't go well because I couldn't see the punches. <laughs> I played high school football in my contacts and I lost at least one every single game. And so I played most games with one eye closed. But the surgery itself had risk and I had to follow strict instructions for months after the procedure or I could permanently damage my eyes. So the LASIK surgery became the ultimate physical dose of vitamin C. Now I could easily dodge obstacles, avoid dangers, and follow instructions without glasses or contacts. But it's the spiritual vitamin C that is far more important. I can relate this to my walk with Yeshua as I progress from an immature believer only seeing outlines of what he had in store for me to a mature believer I had to take the spiritual vitamin C continuously. And this was to avoid sinful situations, maintain the armor of God, develop a deep and meaningful witness about salvation through Yeshua. So I or, and we need a lot of vitamin C to stay on the right path. Matthew 14 shares a story that's a perfect image of this. It's the story of Yeshua walking on water to catch up to the boat carrying the disciples. A fierce wind was tossing the boat and everyone was afraid. Yeshua told them to have courage and not be afraid, which meant they needed to listen. And Kepha asked to come to him on the water. Yeshua commands him to come, but Kepha's vitamin C was sufficient for just a few steps as he was distracted by the wind, took his eyes off Yeshua, and when he began to sink, cried out, My master, save me. Yeshua reaches out his hand and grasps him and says, Why did you doubt me? This is what faith is made of. For me, it is hard sometimes to keep my eyes on Yeshua when the storms of life are raging all around me. It's a struggle discern his, to discern his voice in all the noise and to see his face in all the debris. But the more I read scripture and the more I spend time praying, the bigger my supply of vitamin C comes, becomes. The last 12 months have been a challenge at the Cartwright household. A year ago, Annette was diagnosed with metastasized breast cancer. And six uh, months ago, I experienced a knee injury and developed blood clots. Not exactly how we envisioned uh, being empty nesters. Had we not built up a sizable supply of vitamin C, it would have been real easy to sink below the waves. But we celebrate each victory and praise Adonai when we see progress in the shrinkage of a tumor or improved blood flow around the clot. And we battle on knowing that Yeshua's arm is outstretched to keep us above the waves. And, oh yeah, take your vitamin C and C.
Y'all can be seated. Richard, <coughs> again, we're honored uh, and privileged to have uh, Rich Cleary with us again this morning. Many of you have gotten to know him uh, over the months that he's been uh, advising us and uh, serving us and visiting us. And so. Lord, may you bless our brother this morning. We know that you've given him a timely word for this congregation. May we have ears to hear and hearts that are open to receive it. In Yeshua's name, amen. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. That was a good darash. Thank you. All right. Let's pray. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we thank you that you are here with us in Messiah Yeshua and the power of the Holy Spirit. We just continue to welcome your presence here. We want you to rule and reign right here with this portion of your family. So would you pour out your love upon us? Would you sanctify us by your word of truth? Would you encourage us, comfort us, heal us, sanctify us, build us up, and give us courage for these days? Say, you're so good. You're always good. You're only good. There's nothing unjust about you. There's nothing unrighteous about you. There's no evil in your heart. You're always faithful. You're always trustworthy. You're always true. So we just dedicate this time of the ministry of your word to your name's sake. We say sanctified be your name. Hashem Yeshua. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I want to give a message today on why it is wisdom for us as New Covenant believers to regularly meditate and delight in the 10 words. Why it is wisdom for us as New Covenant believers to regularly meditate upon and delight in the 10 words given to Israel at Mount Sinai. If Yeshua violated or abolished the 10 words. He couldn't be the Jewish Messiah. Our profession of Yeshua as the Messiah of Israel and the Savior of the world partly depends on his allegiance 
to the ten words and his honoring of those ten words and his perpetuation of those ten words in the new covenant that he would ratify in his blood on the cross. So we need to know why it is so important for us to regularly meditate upon and delight in these ten words. And there are at least 30 to 50 reasons why it's wise to do this. I, I want to give us seven. Seven reasons why it is wisdom for us to meditate upon and delight in the ten words given on Mount Sinai. I want to begin just by reading Psalm 1 to us, which I know is a familiar psalm but it's so powerful. So if you want to follow along, you can go to Psalm 1. I'm going to be reading from the English Standard Version today. Happy is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, or blessed, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. I also want to read one verse from Psalm 40 in verse 8. This is in the ESV. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. So a sign of the law or the Torah being in our heart is we delight in it. So we can turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 5 where we have the 10 words uh, being given to the second generation of Israelites before they enter the promised land. And we will begin going through these reasons. Reason number one, why it's wisdom for us to regularly meditate on the ten words and delight in them, is to remember our salvation. Did you know in the Hebrew Bible, the ten words are never called the Ten Commandments? They're never called the Ten Commandments. They are the Ten Commandments, but they're more than the Ten Commandments. They're called the Ten Words. But due to tradition, they've been translated as the Ten Commandments. But that's actually not what the literal Hebrew says. We have this language, Ten Words, in a few different places. Exodus 34, 28, uh, Deuteronomy 4, 13, and Deuteronomy 10, 4. And each time, they're referred to as the ten words. This is very important because the first reason why I believe it's wisdom for us to meditate upon the ten words and to lighten the ten words is to actually remember our salvation. In Deuteronomy 5, 6, we have the beginning of the ten words. In Deuteronomy 5, 6, it says, I am Adonai, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The ten words begins with God declaring who he is and declaring that he saved his people out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. He declares himself to be Israel's savior. 
And the whole Bible teaches the message of salvation by grace through faith. Did you know that? The whole Bible teaches the message of salvation by grace through faith. Was Abraham justified by works of the law? He was justified by faith in the promise. Genesis 15, 6. The Torah doesn't begin with commandments. The first word of instruction given at Mount Sinai is not a commandment. It's a declaration of who God is. The ten words begin with salvation by grace. So when we meditate on the ten words, we remember our salvation by grace. We remember that in the new covenant, we have been saved by grace also through the death, burial, and resurrection of Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah and Savior of the world. So, when we read the ten words, when we meditate on the ten words, we remember our salvation. One of the ten words, the ten word uh, commandment on the Sabbath tells us to do what? Look at verse 15 of chapter 5. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord commanded you to keep the Sabbath day holy. So one of the commands every Shabbat is to remember that we were slaves. Did you know that? That today, on this Shabbat, we are to remember that we were slaves. That we were not a free people. That we were in bondage. All of us, believers in Yeshua, we were slaves of sin. We were under the prince of the power of the air, that spirit who works in all the sons of disobedience. We had hearts of stone. We had uncircumcised hearts. We were sinners. We were hostile to God in our minds. We were his enemies. And on Shabbat, we remember our salvation. Actually, every day we're to remember our salvation. Every day we're to remember our salvation. One of the reasons we need to regularly meditate on the ten words is to remember our salvation. Remember. Do you remember when you weren't a free person? Do you remember when you were a slave to sin? Do you remember how horrible it was to be under the oppression of the devil? Do you remember the burden of your guilt? Do you remember the sorrow and the pain, the loneliness, the loneliness, the shame and the guilt? Do you remember what it was like? The Lord's been impressing upon me. Do not forget where you were before I called you. So when we remember the ten words, we remember our salvation. Remember the days we were not free in the Messiah. So that's number one reason, to remember our salvation. Number two, to remember who Adonai our God is. In verse five, once again, in verse six, I'm sorry, verse six, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. As new covenant believers, Jews and Gentiles, when we meditate on the 10 words, we remember he is our God. We remember that Adonai is our God. We belong to him. We remember he redeemed us. We're not our own anymore. We belong to him. Our our bodies, our temples of the Holy Spirit redeemed by the blood of his son. When we remember these ten words in light of the fullness of the new covenant, which we should read them in the fullness of the new covenant, We remember that he is our God. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob is our God. The creator of the universe and everything in it. He is our God. 
the one who rules over everything. He is our God, the one who's a consuming fire. He is our God, the one who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and faithfulness. He is our God, the one who sent his beloved son to die for our sins and to be buried and to be raised from the dead. He is our God. We meditate on the ten words to remember who Adonai is. This is the intent of Moses. Moses wants us to know God. When the ten words get reduced to just moral behaviors and they remove the context of the glory and the majesty and the greatness and the beauty of God, they become something less than they actually are. They appear less than they really are. When we meditate on the ten words, we meditate on to remember who he is. Number three, we meditate on the ten words to remember who we are. To remember that we are a free people. As new covenant believers, we are free in Messiah Yeshua. This is a charter of freedom. This was a charter given to Israel. And it was a charter of freedom. They were a people who lived under the tyranny of Egypt and the gods of Egypt. They were a people that did not have religious freedom. Actually, all their rights were taken away. All their unalienable rights were violated in their context of darkness. And God redeemed them and made them a free nation and gave them a charter of freedom to show them how to live as a free people. So we remember who we are when we meditate in the ten words. You know, in Exodus 19, 5 through 6, this was before the giving of the Torah at Sinai, God calls his people a kingdom of priests. And they were to obey his covenant, obey his commands as a kingdom of priests. Now, Israel continues to be a kingdom of priests in Messiah Yeshua, don't they? Yes, they do. And the Gentiles grafted into Israel also get to live as kingdom of priests, don't they? Yes, they do. So we are a kingdom of priests. When we meditate on these ten words, we remember how to live as a free people, as a kingdom of priests. We remember our identity to be a people who do and teach God's commands. Did you know this is who we are? I'm not saying that's the only way to describe who we are, but this is who we are. Think Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Right? We are to be a people who do and teach the commandments of God and inherit the kingdom of God by the grace of God. So we remember who we are as a free people, as a redeemed people, as a saved people, as a people who by the grace of God are to do and teach the commandments of God as a kingdom of priests. Number four. To remember how Adonai wants to be loved and how he wants our neighbors to be treated by us. In Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Yeshua says, these are the greatest commandments, right? To love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors ourself. He's summarizing the Decalogue. The Decalogue was a, a way of describing the ten words. Deca meaning ten and log from logos, meaning word, the ten words. So Decalogue is actually an accurate Greek translation of the ten words. But the ten words show us how God wants us to love him and how he wants us to treat our neighbors. So when we meditate on them and delight in them, we're reminded, we're remembering how God wants to be loved and how he wants our neighbor to be treated by us. And I'm suggesting that regular meditation on the ten words is important because what's the most important commandment? To love Adonai, our God, with all our heart, soul, 
mind, and strength. And the one like it, to love our neighbors herself. Who, who forgets sometimes? I need to be reminded. And this is why it's important to remember by regular meditation. Remembering how Adonai wants to be loved by us and how he wants our neighbor to be treated by us. Did you know in the ancient world, there was covenant documents that other nations had, you could call them treaties, that resemble the ten words? Who's ever seen those? I want to give you an example. You'll see that there is a resemblance, but it's also vastly different. This might surprise some of you. Let me read one ancient Near Eastern uh, example of something similar but vastly different from the ten words. So a suzerain was a pagan king. Don't have any other suzerain. You shall have no other gods before me. But this time it was, don't have any other suzerain. So that the king is putting himself as the highest place of honor. Obviously, that's vastly different from what Adonai is saying, right? Listen to this. Respect the image of the suzerain. Sounds a lot different than don't make for yourself a graven image, right? This document is saying, respect the image of the suzerain. Respect the idol of me. That's what the king is saying. How about this? Do not speak evilly of the suzerain and do not hold guiltless those who do. Instead of what? Do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, and he's not going to hold guiltless those who do. Can you see the resemblance? But it's vastly different. One centered around the creator God, the true king of all, and one centered around a created person who's exalting himself in the place of the creator. Vastly different. There is no comparable commandment to the Sabbath commandment in the ancient Eries. So it would have stood out to Israel. And I would say the Sabbath commandment is a commandment that was intended to exalt the grace of God. That's why, that's why Yeshua was so adamant about liberating people from legalistic interpretations of the Sabbath because the Sabbath commandment was actually a reminder of the incredible grace of God. The grace of God in creation, right? He created everything in the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all that in it in six days, and he rested on the seventh day, which in the ancient world, this image of him resting would be a king being enthroned and taking his rest after bringing order out of chaos. But creation, wasn't it an act of grace? I mean, wasn't the creation of the world an act of generosity and overflowing grace? It certainly was. The Sabbath was to remind us of the grace of God in creating everything. But also the Deuteronomy uh, version of the Ten Words, it links the Sabbath to what? Redemption. Remember you were slaves in Egypt and how Adonai brought you out of the land of Egypt with a with, a, with mighty power and an outstretched hand. The Sabbath was a reminder of redemption and salvation by grace. But there's nothing comparable to the Sabbath commandment in the ancient world. This was totally unique because this idea of God the Creator saving a people for Himself by grace, by mercy, by his generosity, by his own righteousness, by his own faithfulness. This was a unique revelation that the world needed, that God entrusted to Israel. And Israel's keeping of the Shabbat 
was to steward this revelation of this God of grace, this God who redeems by grace, this God who takes people out of oppression and tyranny and gives them freedom and gives them rest. The next one in this ancient treaty, do not commit murder against any of the people of the suzerains. You can murder other people. You just couldn't murder the people of the suzerain because he saw them as his property. You see the difference between this ancient code and the ten words? So when we read the ten words, and even in light of this ancient context, we see who God is, how gracious he is, how compassionate he is, how much he cares about everybody's rights. I don't want anybody's life to be taken unjustly. A vast difference from this suzerain. Or how about this? Do not engage in sexual behavior with any of the suzerain's family. So you can do it with other people, just not the suzerain's family because he doesn't want his line corrupted. But you see the parallels? But I want you to feel the differences. How about this? Do not steal what belongs to the suzerain. So if it doesn't belong to him, go ahead. Be a thief, but just don't steal what belongs to the suzerain. A lot different from our God, who respects the property of all of his people. Actually, every single human being on the earth, he respects their property or what has been entrusted to them or what has been given to them. Listen to this one. Do not swear falsely. Violate the oath to the suzerain. We're seeing the vast difference here, I hope. Do not, covet belong, that, do not covet what belongs to the suzerain. You can covet other people's stuff, just not what belongs to the suzerain. So, when we remember how Adonai wants to be loved and how he wants us to treat our neighbor through meditation on the ten words, we see the beauty of his instruction. We see how much he loves humanity. Yes, how he wants us to relate to him as a people redeemed and saved by grace. How he wants to be loved. How he, his love language we could say. But we see also, you know, how much he cares for each human being. Take, for example, the commandment, you shall have, you shall not commit adultery. Like, beloved, what's going on in the moral revolution out there today? You know how far we've come from this? We've come so far from the beauty of this commandment. Like, we as believers believe that our neighbor has the right that nobody would encroach upon their spouse. Don't you believe your neighbor has that right? Don't you believe that your neighbor has the right not to be violated in a sexual way? We do believe that. We do believe that our neighbor has that right. We do believe that's part of what it means to love our neighbors herself, is to, is to protect the purity of our neighbor. To not let the enemy or sin influence us in a way that we would violate the purity of our neighbor. The world needs this as a witness today. We need to uphold firmly, boldly, marriage between one man and one woman. And honor the purity of the marriage. It's crucial. Number five. Why, why it's wisdom to regularly meditate upon and delight in the ten words. To remember our call to be a witness for his namesake. In Deuteronomy uh, 4, verse 7, it says, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is with us? 
whenever we call upon him. Now, that's in the context of the verse prior, which says, keep them, talking about these covenant words, and do them, for that will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear all these statutes will say, say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So, as we remember these 10 words and we delight in them and we live in them, this is a huge part of our witness to the world. That they will see the presence of God with us as we walk out his ways in intimate relationship with him as a people saved by his grace. And they will see a witness of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's not underestimate the power of our witness in keeping these words by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's not underestimate the reality of what the Scripture says here, that when we walk in God's ways, it has the effect of providing a witness to the nations. You know, there's a lot of talk about being a witness But beloved, we are a witness whether we try to be or not. We are always witnessing. And God's saying, it's really important to me that a big part of your witness of me in the world is you hearing and obeying my commandments by the grace of God. This is a big part of being a witness. The Sermon on the Mount, right? Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, this is about what? Being a light to the world and being a salty people and letting your uh, deeds uh, shine forth so that people will glorify our Father in heaven. Well, that's great, Yeshua. How do we do that? Then he does what? He talks about the ten words. He talks about the commandments in the new covenant order. The commandments that he wants his disciples to follow. It's the same principle. The way Yeshua taught his people in Matthew 5 to be witnesses was to live out the reality of the commandments of God as, from a place of intimate relationship with him. He's not violating the principle of Deuteronomy 4. He's bringing that principle to fullness for his disciples in the new covenant. So let's not underestimate the powerful witness of obedience to the commands of God. I want us to get stronger in our obedience from a place of intimacy, from a place of the power of the Holy Spirit, from a place of the grace of God demonstrating righteousness and justice in every sphere of life. This is not just possible in the new covenant. It's promised in the new covenant. Obedience isn't just possible in the new covenant. It's promised in the new covenant. We need to renounce every lie that tells us that it's normal to violate the standards of God. That is a lie. That is anti-biblical. Yes, there is atonement for sin, right? If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Yeshua the Messiah, the righteous one. But John says, I write these things so that you won't sin. Not to justify sin. Not to make excuses for sin. Not to explain away why we can't be righteous in the new covenant. Because of human nature or because of the fall. The power of the cross liberates us from the bondage of sin. And we need to restore the full integrity and power of the gospel that saves us from the bondage of sin and by the power of the Holy Spirit grow in the image of Yeshua the Messiah and obey his commandments as a witnessing community. This is the power of the blood of Yeshua the Messiah. Amen? Are you guys in agreement with this? I hope so. I'm trusting you are. Number six, a why it is wisdom for us to regularly meditate upon and delight in the ten words. Number six, to remember our responsibility to our children and grandchildren and future generations. We do the Shema every Saturday, right? Every Shabbat. We declare the Shema. Now, what does the Shema say? 
Because you can't separate the Shema from the ten words. Did you know that? Did you know the records of early Judaism, like first century time period, the ten words were recited with the Shema. The, the linkage between the ten words and the Shema was strong. That it was a common practice for Jewish people to recite the Shema with the ten words. Because contextually, according to Moses, you can't separate them. So in Deuteronomy 6, 4, we hear, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. What words is he talking about? In the context, he's talking about the 10 words, right? Turn back a page, Deuteronomy chapter 5. This is continuing the message, right? He's still giving a message here, and Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9 is building on what he just shared about the repeating of the 10 words. So I'm saying we need to meditate on the 10 words regularly, and delight in them to remember our responsibility to our children and grandchildren and future generations. Let me read something also in uh, Jeremiah 32, which is a new covenant promise, because it's coming right after Jeremiah 31. It's still talking about the message of the new covenant. In Jeremiah 32, uh, in the ESV, it's verse 38 and 39. It's repeating this this core promise of the new covenant. And they shall be my people and I will be their God. I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for their own good and the good of their children after them. Verse 40, I will make with them an everlasting covenant. This is the new covenant in Yeshua the Messiah's blood. That I will not turn away from doing good to them and I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me. We are new creations through the, through the Holy Spirit. We are new creations of Messiah. Show. We have a new heart, a new spirit. The Torah is within our heart. God has given us a heart to, to be allegiant to him and his son. God has given us a heart that loves him and his son. God has given us a heart that wants to obey the commandments of God. One reason to obey the commandments is because it is good for our children and our children's children and future generations. The Torah repeats this over and over and over as a motivation for obedience because when we obey the commandments by the grace of God, it creates greater opportunity for our children also to walk with God. Now, if anybody is feeling any condemnation because of parental failures, please don't receive that message. Because there's forgiveness for our parental failures. And also, don't underestimate the power of your present and future obedience, even to adult children. It doesn't, it doesn't say... Uh, it's only going to go well for your children when they're younger. doesn't say that. So as adults who have adult children, your obedience to the commandments of God also can have a great blessing and leave a legacy to your children and grandchildren. I've heard stories of people who even go to be with the Lord and later on in life, their children remember the faithfulness their parents lived in the latter years. And it inspired them and it encouraged them. And it was a spiritual legacy that was left to them that they could live their life after. So do not let the enemy make you wallow in shame or guilt of the past. But also, do not let the enemy lie to you and say that your present obedience to God is null and void in its impact to your adult children, if you have adult children. That is not true. That is not true. And for those of us who still have younger children, 
We meditate on the ten words to remember our responsibility to diligently teach our children every day the commands of God. Amen? Number seven, the last one. Last reason why I'm suggesting it's wisdom for us to regularly meditate upon and delight in the ten words. Number seven, to remember the forgiveness of our sins and honor the blood of the new covenant. To remember the forgiveness of our sins and honor the blood of the new covenant. I want to read Titus chapter 2, my favorite passage on the grace of God in the new covenant scriptures. Titus chapter 2, beginning in uh, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Yeshua the Messiah, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. To redeem us from what? All lawlessness. We read the ten words to remember, one, that he's forgiven us for all the ways we've broken the ten words. We remember our forgiveness through the blood of Yeshua. But we don't just remember what we've been forgiven. We remember the purpose of the cross wasn't just forgiveness, but to actually liberate us from lawlessness. To liberate us from the ways that we were in bondage to breaking the ten words. To liberate us to be free people who can keep the ten words in the power of the Holy Spirit by the grace of God because we're in love with the one who saved us. We can also see in Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, uh, Hebrews 10, 15 through 18, uh, two quotations of Jeremiah 31 showing that through the blood of the new covenant we have the forgiveness of sins committed under the first covenant. We have the forgiveness of sins for the transgressions against the first covenant. Hebrews 9.15 is one of the relationships between the Sinai covenant and the new covenant. The only way to receive the forgiveness of sins for Jews and Gentiles in regard to the transgressions of the first covenant is the atonement of Yeshua the Messiah. So we remember all the sins we've been forgiven when we meditate in the ten words. But we also remember the purpose of the cross was to liberate us from lawlessness, to make us a people who love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourself by the grace of God and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So seven reasons that we went over today of why it's wisdom for us to regularly meditate upon and delight in the ten words. To remember our salvation. To remember who Adonai is. That's number two. Number three, to remember who we are. Number four, to remember how Adonai wants to be loved. And how he wants our neighbor to be treated by us. That's number four. Number five, to remember our call to be a witness for his namesake. Number six, to remember our responsibility to our children and grandchildren and future generations. And number seven, to remember the forgiveness of all of our sins and honor the blood of the new covenant that brings the Torah upon our heart and mind. Let's pray. I want to encourage us to renew our hearts Study, meditation, and delight upon these 10 words. I want to encourage us, if you stand to your feet, please. I want to encourage us, I want to encourage you to renew in your heart a full dedication and commitment to remember these 10 words by regularly meditating upon them and delighting in them in light of the fullness of the new covenant. I would encourage you to live these out by the power of the Holy Spirit in your everyday life 
as a witnessing people, boldly live out the commandments of God. Boldly be unashamed of the gospel of Messiah Yeshua. We are in a time where we need to be strong and we need to be victorious in spiritual warfare. And one biblical principle of spiritual warfare is when you disobey, you don't win. It's all through the Bible. You get defeated through disobedience. You want to lose in spiritual warfare? Disobey the covenant commands of God. You can pray the most binding, loosing prayers you want to pray, but if you're disobeying the the God who saved you and redeemed you, that's just superstition. Praying is an important part of spiritual warfare, but it's not a substitute for obedience. So if there's any compromise in your life, I want to encourage you today to, to eradicate that. To ask God to take any compromise out of your heart. We cannot be in compromise in this time period. We never should be in compromise. We can have no compromise. Zero. The new covenant promises an undivided heart. Jesus died so you could have an undivided heart. If there's any division in your heart, if you're double-minded in any way, this is the day that God wants to forgive you for that and restore in you this awesome promise of an undivided heart. It's all by the grace of God. It's all because he loves us. He wants intimacy and closeness with us, but he also wants us to fulfill our calling. And we can't do that without the power of the Holy Spirit and living in integrity in the new covenant. Amen? So, Father, let's, let's just pray. I'm going to pray the Lord's Prayer in light of this. So, Father in heaven, sanctified be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. Deliver us from lawlessness. Deliver us from compromise. Deliver us from a divided heart. Deliver us from any bondage, any addiction. We say the cross is powerful to set us free right now. The blood of Yeshua is powerful to bring forgiveness of any sin right now. We say there's no condemnation for us in Messiah Yeshua. Breathe on us an energizing to live out the reality of the new covenant for this congregation, Brit Hadashah. New covenant messianic congregation. Empower this congregation to be a bright, burning lamp here in Memphis. A witnessing community, an evangelistic community that Yeshua is the Jewish Messiah for all people. Shabbat Shalom. can be seated for a moment. First, thank you for that word, Rick. That was awesome. Thank you. It is always a blessing to, to be able to spend time with Rich and to have him share the Lord's heart and will for us. Amen. Well, it is great to see y'all today. This is uh, like the fullest house in months. And that is totally awesome. Um, reminder, registration's open for next week. So don't wait. Or you'll be looking at the week after next. <laughs> Amen. Remind everybody, if you're registered for service, you can join us for Torah study at 9 o'clock. If you're not coming for whatever reason, can't get registered or whatever, we're still doing 
a Zoom component to tour service, so we'd love to have you join us at 9 o'clock. Information on that's available in the weekly newsletter, so if you're not signed up for that, we'll get signed up for that. You can do that on the website. Our Havra groups are meeting still mostly by Zoom, I think. Um, if you have questions about that, you can talk to Alan, me, uh, Ron, or Rhonda at the office. I'll get you hooked up with whoever's leading one to find out the time, that sort of stuff. Um, Thursday, actually beginning Wednesday evening, was Rosh Hashanah Elul. So we're now in the month leading up to the month of Tishrei. And the first of Tishrei is significant, right? Because that's Yom Teruah, Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. So this traditionally is a month for introspection, which I think spending some time remembering what we have to be thankful for, remembering what God expects of us is probably a great way to spend this next month. So you all have four weeks. As we'll have the Erev service uh, four weeks from yesterday and the Rosh Hashanah service followed by Tashlik uh, four weeks from today. Okay, coming up next week, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper, the remembrance of Messiah. There's that remember thing again, isn't it? Um, so prepare yourselves this week to, to be a part of that. Of course, the first thing is make sure you register, but... Get with God in your, in your quiet time and place and, and prepare your hearts for that. Amen. Um, one last thing. Y'all are here. The Zadalka boxes are open um, as part of our worship. If you're not able to join us, uh, I think Alan mentioned this in the welcome, uh, you can continue to give online um, or you can rely on snail mail. Amen. Amen. Alan, will you come up and dismiss us? All right, let's stand. I guess I told you you sit for a minute. <laughs> okay. Uh, I thought there was something more to add, but I forgot. Give me a moment. <laughs> we finished the Empowers class. Oh, I know it. Yes, we did finish the Empowers class. Praise God. That was, that was a great time. Zoomed it this year. Is uh, I'm speaking now to the people out there in uh, cyberspace that we will take uh, the remembrance of Messiah next week, and we would encourage anyone who is maybe participating through the live streaming can do that at, at home as well, so you could be prepared for that. I apologize that the last time we did it, we uh, I stopped the service before we. Uh, took the elements here in the sanctuary, uh, and uh, we won't we won't do that again. Well, we close with uh, familiar verses, but a powerful uh, blessing. Numbers chapter six. The Lord spoke to Moses. He said, "Speak to Aaron and to his sons, and in this manner shall you bless the children of Israel. And you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you." The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace, his shalom. And we proclaim this blessing today to Jew and Gentile, one in Messiah, called to be a light to the world. Lord, may you let our light shine before men. They might see our good deeds, and glorify our Father in heaven. We proclaim this in that name above all names, Yeshua HaMashiach, Sikenu, Yeshua the Messiah, who is our righteousness. Yivarek Adonai V'yishmarecha Yoel Adonai Panavelecha v'chunecha Yisra Adonai Panavelecha V'yasem lecha Shalom
Amen, amen, Shabbat Shalom. You are dismissed.